Welcome to Idle Red Hands Weekly. I'm Jeremy. I'm Chris. And what is Idle Red Hands Weekly? It is the pursuit of gratification from vanity or egotistic admiration of one's idealized self-image and attributes. Also considered a social or cultural problem, it is one of the three dark triadic personality traits, the others being psychopathy and Machiavellianism, usually considered a problem in a person or group's relationship with self and others. Where did that one come from? <laughs> that's narcissism. Oh, all right. All right. <laughs> so I think that's something that, uh, yeah, as a culture, as a, as a world culture, I think we're combating because uh, social media is so friendly to the narcissist. Yeah. Okay. It's so different now, though, because narcissism used to be a positive thing. Like people thought they were un, they couldn't fail. They were unbeatable. They were, they were Hmm, perfect. Okay. Their admiration of themselves was a perfection. And now there's this negative narcissism. There's people that are, well, let me tell you what's wrong with me. Let me give you a list hmm, okay. of all of my mental disorders and my problems. And I can't, I, I'm no good in relationships and I can't remember things and I'm no, I can't do math. It's a self obsession, but it's a self obsession with the negative aspects of yourself instead of the, the positive things that would actually keep you kind of ignorant enough to, to move past obstacles and just kind of charge ahead blindly and succeed. So kind of akin to hypochondria? Kind of. It's yeah, and it's kind of a self defeating thing. It's a it's a self obsession and maybe like a self introspection that's so so that's so critical that it, it just undermines I can't do that. I'm just no good. I'm not gonna be able to do that. I certainly see that happening. Mm -hmm. I guess the the conversion with social media, what I would say is I think sure, I I've seen social media posts like that and I'm not gonna say how many or, or that that's a lot, but on the one hand, sure. I'm sure there are people that are like that and is kind of self-defeating. On the other hand, I think, at least for, for me, there's more of a sharing of information where it's kind of like celebrities or, or famous people or or people you look look up to sharing this information that yeah i do have these problems and i've still achieved this thing and kind mm. of normalizing or at least helping to normalize things that might not have been talked about mm. in the past oh, yeah. so well there are well there is a, a negative aspect to it and there certainly is a negative aspect to narcissism i i think in healthy doses mm. these, yeah, yeah. these things can be positive and i can in no way say what a healthy dose of that thing is. Yeah, <laughs> Right, yeah, and they do say that psychologically, that a healthy egotism is not narcissism, and a healthy self-interest is a good thing, mm. because it is that thing that kind of helps you keep moving forward instead of giving up, and maybe you're not going to succeed, but you're going to try. Right. It's funny how much of your you see that, and how we have so many mechanisms now that serve it so completely, mm. and the selfie is just this icon of like just you know navel gazing like i am so interesting <laughs> interesting interestingly i was wondering if this was going to come up because years ago i would have agreed with you regards to selfie mm -hmm. more recently i have seen it as a tool of self-empowerment that at least for some people can help for lack of a better term solidify their own self-image mm. and it's mm. a way to control public perception of your image, which in turn helps boost your self-confidence and solidify your self-image. So where yeah, I would have yeah. agreed with you in the past, mm -hmm. I've, I've self, I've, and again, healthy quantities. And, you know, there, there are ways to go overboard with selfies and stuff like that. Right. But I, I do think that now it can be a helpful tool. Mm, I think that's true. And I think that, unfortunately, that's not most of the people that are actively taking pictures of themselves are not. It's more like a, a, the, the image that they're creating is uh, is very damaging. It's not okay. a, it's not about like actually helping explore their, their real self and who they want to be. It's just like you're going to see me on some beautiful beaches and you're going to oh, see sure. me eating amazing food and you're going to feel terrible. And that makes me feel good <laughs> i'm sure you know i'm i'm sure there is that aspect to it mm -hmm. but I, I, again even like posting because yeah people following people on instagram you're like wow that's an, an awesome shot you know or, or like background modeling lighting all that stuff but it, it does kind of sure it can be used negatively mm -hmm. but it can also be a way to kind of make you feel better where again you are the, the person posting this is kind of controlling the image their their public image mm. which doesn't necessarily have to be a negative Right, right. When I think the, the self-portrait, there's a lot of artists that have used this, and especially women photographers and artists that have used the self-portrait very powerfully and very effectively to explore not only their own identity, but the, you know, the, the role of women, the images mm -hmm. of women. Mm -hmm. And, and I think a lot of them are doing some good stuff on Instagram. Mm. If you don't follow Cindy Sherman, you should, okay. because she's doing amazing things with digital imagery and just, it's all images of herself and they're unrecognizable. They're oh, so, they're okay. so okay. transformative. And so there's a lot going on in there and in the same way that it is kind of playing with the idea of vanity mm. or your own self-image. Uh, uh, and she's, she's been doing that forever. She's, you know, 
did kind of classic historical costume, mm, you know, self, okay, cool. uh, self uh, photography in that. There's still people that are aware of, of how powerful this is and how kind of transformative it is to be able to have control of your own image. But yeah, selfies, though, still are such a, a blight. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. I disagree with you there, but I understand where you're coming from. No, as far as, far as like, as far as like social interaction, like, oh, you know, sure, okay. yeah, like in public selfies. Oh, I mean, so you're yeah, talking about people, people whipping out the selfie yeah, stick on right, like Gotamburi and clogging up the walkways. Right. That I will agree with. Okay. <laughs> the physical act of taking a selfie can be problematic or, or kind of kind of <laughs> cause a nuisance for people like us. Right. Uh, right. You know, kind of walking around. But <laughs> yeah. Last time, I, I forget who, I forget the artist who did it, but there was a really interesting piece about, okay, the Venus de Milo, mm-hmm. right? Here's this art object that you were supposed to admire. The artist put arms on it and put a phone in its hand <laughs> so that the Venus de Milo was taking a selfie. Mm-hmm. And kind of the point they were making was when this beauty is presented for other people to consume why is that acceptable but then you turn that around and make the statue kind of taking a picture of her own beauty for her own self Mm -hmm. why does that why is that suddenly not correct and why does that suddenly Mm -hmm. become vanity Mm -hmm. and i I forget the artist who did it but i thought that was really interesting yeah that that is very interesting but no segue to ttrpgs but (laughs) (laughs) yeah how are we gonna get back i don't know we're just not we're just gonna have to jump So what have you been doing this week? Prepping for the Alien game All that right. I'm running on Sunday. And speaking of Instagram, uh, I put up a pic of the name badges and personal agenda cards that oh, cool. I just made. Excellent. How about yourself? Speaking of Instagram, <laughs> I, I, I put up the uh, the photos of the uh, the Gretchen, the uh, the contrast paint orcs, and uh, realized, yeah, I, I got to come up with a better way to photograph. I mean, because when, once you're going that small, my camera is like focusing on, I, I think mm. most of the things were not in focus. So I've got to have a more kind of formalized, like a, like a stand and shoot everything right. because even like kind of bracing the phone you just can't get great yeah things. yeah i put up the the series of those and uh yeah realized i need a better way <laughs> to photograph minis <laughs> when i was still taking pictures of the mobile frame zero lego mechs that i put together mm-hmm. um, i just made myself a little backdrop but for the longest time wanted to get one of those little nine by nine collapsible light boxes that mm. I saw at uh, Yodabashi camera right. with like a little turntable and that might be something to do. Yeah, yeah. That would be nice to yeah, just have a, a real neutral background because I just I'm relying on the depth of field to like blur the background so you don't see all oh, yeah, the yeah. paints and everything on the table. And we also this week had a session of the sprawl. You ran the yes. sprawl. Yeah. Which may was a one shot intention it though. Intended to be one to be. shot. But based on how far people got, <laughs> it may turn into a campaign. Yeah. I think people were enjoying their characters and yeah, we're really getting into it. So I think yeah, it, it and it's a good group, so I think it might be worth that. Yeah. I, I forgot how much like herding cats <laughs> playing with our group can be. Right. Which I'm sure poor John can attest to. <laughs> yeah, it was still fun and everyone had a lot of fun and that's the most important thing. I guess getting back to the alien thing. I'm actually more apprehensive to run the alien game than i am for other games Mm -hmm. because i'm doing a module Mm. even though you can of course improv stuff i'm a bit more worried about forgetting stuff or 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 not dropping enough clues or saying Mm -hmm. something that then kind of gets affected by something else that happens in the module (laughs) whereas running an improv game like with sprawl i can just go oh uh yeah okay you're going there okay so this thing happens and just make stuff up as you're going along yeah that was the thing yeah when i was running our session that was the thing that i ran into it's like oh i said this (laughs) (laughs) right so now we got to play it like this but it actually says this yeah yeah yeah, because you can't fact check everything yeah Yeah, so you're just like oh yeah let's go with that and then yeah that's those little complications the fun of running a module which is why most of the time you just like throw it out and go here's what we're doing and as far as gaming stuff, the other thing that I did that kind of is video game related mm. is um went back to Path of Exile. And that was a game that I played when it first came out in 2013. If you've ever played Diablo, it's just kind of an, an indie free-to-play uh, d- version of Diablo. Oh, really? Okay. But real dark, you know, r- you know real scary and dark. And it's okay. a lot of like a lot of zombies and undead and just like horrific creatures. And it's on the PlayStation 4 now. And so it's free to play. And I just wanted to see what it looked like and what stages it was at. And they have added so much in these past six years. Hmm. It's it's amazing. The game is just, it, it was really based on end game. Like you you got through the campaign very quickly and then we're kind of had a character ready for some end game activities. And a lot of that was like a competitive or, or cooperative okay. uh, kind of, you know, raids and things. But um, now there is so much content and it seems like they've lowered the difficulty so you actually can get through it because okay. i remember playing it when it was first out it was insanely difficult hmm. and you hit so many bosses and things that were roadblocks that you had to kind of grind to right. defeat but the thing that I, I really like about it is it's got a probably the most gorgeous skill tree in any game i've ever seen hmm. and a lot of people kind of knock this off i think 
Dragon Age Inquisition and a couple of other games have knocked it off. But it's these beautiful concentric circles that you, same with the skills, you kind of, when you buy that skill point, you kind of equip a gem in okay. all of these things. And it's just, it, it's endless. It's just so expansive. And it's interesting the way that it's connected. So if you're, you basically start with the three main attributes of strength, agility, and uh, wisdom, and you branch off from there. So if so you're it's doing- it's Numenera. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> so if you're doing, if you're doing a, a, a melee build or a ranged build or a magic build, you go off from there, but there's, okay, there's okay. overlap. So it's, mm-hmm. it's so well designed that a lot of the circles overlap. So you can go, okay, I'm pretty strong, but I want to use magic. So I'm going to you know, jump onto right, this right. wisdom and, and build my intelligence. Oh, that's cool. And I'm guessing it's fairly intuitive to use as well. So like, mm-hmm. not only does it look nice, but it has an effective or, or easy to use user interface. Yes. Like yeah, it's re- yeah, it's really nice. And they, they've done a system now too, where you have buyback points where you can kind of earn these points as you progress. So if you want to kind of respec you're, okay. You can kind okay. Of go back. Oh, so you can't? Can you move gems around? You because can, as soon yes. as you said gems, I thought Final Fantasy VII Materia, oh, which right. is the only game I've played. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh-huh. You you can kind of backtrack along what you how you've already advanced. Mm. But if you want to do a new build, you should just start a new character because okay. they've got I think six character classes that you can play. And uh, but they're they're really fun. And the the way that the skills with those gems they go into your gear. They're mm. they're, slot, they're socketed into your gear. They combo really nicely. So the fun thing is I'm playing the Templar, and so he, one of his basic very powerful things is a um, purifying flame so you're throwing this fire and it does a lot of damage kind of area damage and the ground that it it hits becomes consecrated ground so it's healing oh cool so i'm raising zombies raising zombie minions sending them at people and then just healing them as they attack it's beautiful <laughs> so you're you're an anti-templar because anti- yes. I, I didn't think a consecrated ground raised or healed a zombie <laughs> you wouldn't think it does but it actually does because they're my zombies they're, oh, they're, they're, right. yeah so it's it's nice because you are corrupt you're uh, all of the characters are you know exiled oh so yeah. that's why it's dark because you're all bad yes yes okay. so you've been you know exiled you've, you've you've left the church you've left everything that you're doing is going against the world and basically you're survivor i can't believe how much they've added to that game and it's a free Oh wow! To play a game, yeah, that's it's incredible. Is it only on PS4 though. It's originally, it's still PC. I'm not sure if they've done it. Probably on Xbox. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun to get back into it, and the setting is just amazing. Oh, cool. As far as Kickstarters, there was one thing that I, I wanted to uh, mention. Our friend of the podcast, uh, Cass Sawinski, uh, is back on Kickstarter with the Dungeon Tiles that they originally released. Oh, cool. They're manufacturing themselves originally with uh, industrial level 3D printing. So they're doing a LAM system, so a, a layer additive manufacturing, and offering them also pre-painted. But so many people were begging for the files. And he wanted to maintain quality and kind of control that. Because once mm-hmm. those files are out mm-hmm. in the wild, the fear is they're just going to be posted right. everywhere. Right. And this newest Kickstarter is only offering that original set that they created for the previous campaign of the STL files, as well as 12 miniatures. So the, hmm. the, some of the sculpts, the digital sculpts, digital files of their original seven dwarves and five monsters that they had done for the uh, original Tomb Guardians are also being offered. So the rooms are... are pretty interesting they're, they're held together with magnets so you're going to also have to buy magnets okay. if you're going to print them yourself mm. but uh, they have a lot of specialized rooms that also uh, need leds so there's mm. crystals and little furnaces and things that burn uh, with leds like in the original campaign and now you can actually do those yourselves i held off until the end but i'm my initial thought was five monsters don't pair with seven dwarfs that's supposed to be snow white <laughs> <laughs> but, anyway. Fuck. Yeah. five monsters in the seven my kid's real into disney princesses now and so <laughs> snow white was the first thing that popped in my head sorry (laughs) requiring magnets and leds i guess is kind of a way of not preventing the distribution Mm. of these digital files but i guess kind of i I see them kind of akin to the proprietary dice Mm -hmm. that rpgs are putting out now where as a consumer yeah okay they they kind of stink and this from someone who just spent i don't know how much time and prep for a game Mm -hmm. but (laughs) yeah it's a way of saying okay even if you got the game we're still going to get some money out of you, which as a company, I understand that mm-hmm. kind of sucks as a consumer saying these files might be distributed and we can't really do anything about that mm-hmm. apart from putting some kind of digital rights management right, into right. them. You're going to need a printer and you're going to need LEDs and certain kind of magnets mm-hmm. to make this work, right. which I think does kind of prevent some mm-hmm. piracy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah, hopefully the uniqueness of the design and at least going to them at le- for the magnets, like, well, what size? Okay. So you got yeah, to go for the magnets. Yeah, yeah. They'll, they'll offer the magnets and I think the LEDs as well have to double check on the kickstarter but we'll put a link to that campaign it's worth supporting because this is a long game system that they're mm. building and this is kind of the next step of it and i think you know they they didn't want to have to do this but i think the demand was there so both of those campaigns were successful so that's good they went back and to get people involved in the game they released the dungeon tile oh, cool but and they're also compatible with all the existing dwarven forge and everything mm. same scale and everything oh right okay kind of mixed feelings on uh, dwarven forge someone who runs a lot of improv games i don't see the need 
mm-hmm, for mm-hmm. physical dungeon tiles. I kind of looked down my nose a little bit at all those big, you know, oh, okay. like Dwarven Forge and, and kind of fantasy game setups where I'm like, really? But okay, well, what happens if they just go, oh, well, we're going to go over here now. And you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> but I mean. Stay on the table. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So it's kind of funny. But I mean, like, that's also a discussion you can have where it's like, you know what? Same thing with a sprawl. Sprawl's mission based. Mm-hmm. And at the beginning of the game, I said, okay, you don't have to take this job. Just know that if you don't. <laughs> I don't have anything else prepped, (laughs) so please take it. (laughs) So I guess it's it's the same thing, you Mm -hmm. know. On the one hand, yeah, sure, the GM or DM has put this together, so don't throw them under the bus by saying, "Uh, yeah, no dungeon today, we're going to go to this other thing. (laughs) But also as, like, the GM, don't be completely tied Mm -hmm. to forcing the players to do something, which I think those physical setups kind of do. Yeah, no, I think that's true. It's real hard with any kind of prep Mm -hmm. to not go... I spent how much time prepping for this thing. Mm-hmm. I don't just want to throw it out. Yeah. This will come up a little bit later, too. And I think that's part of an older era of thinking. I made you a dungeon. Mm. Can you can you beat this dungeon? Oh, yeah. This, yeah, is, yeah. The, this, is, where, this is where we're going to be adventuring today. So it's much less storytelling and, and much more solve my mm. riddles and yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, discover my mystery. I think that's where it comes from because you, they don't give the characters any other option. Just like, oh, we're going to go. No, no, you're not. My feeling is like if that's what you're going to do mm-hmm. and might do this during the alien game, start the characters at a point. Mm. where the, they kind of can't go backwards and the players know, oh, this is what we're doing, mm-hmm. right? Like you start them right there and you just kind of joked about the door closes. No, I mean, like, I've done that before where it's like, <laughs> great, okay, Dungeon Call Adventure, the door's rumbling shut, you know, and boom, boom, mm-hmm. your torches come up. What do you do? Where it's like very clear, okay, this is what we're doing. So yeah, for the Ellen game, great, you're in the air like umbilical. Mm-hmm. Let's go. Yeah. No, I, th- I think that's good. And actually, there was a, uh, we'll jump ahead to uh, uh, questions really quick. There was a, a question on Reddit that a user was asking specifically uh, based on one of our posts in the uh, the Alien RPG. Feedback. Yes. <laughs> he was asking, and I answered for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> but now I'm going to give you the chance to answer that. So I think that'll be a little bit more, <laughs> a little bit better let's well seeing as i don't go on reddit anymore i suppose that's fair as long as you didn't have like a sock puppet of me actually answering (laughs) so the (laughs) the question was i was considering running this the chariot of the gods as a one session game is that possible we'll find out (laughs) after sunday because that's what i'm doing i have a five hour slot to run this i think i'm going into it making some adaptations where i i I think i'm going to shorten if not completely and eliminate that first act Mm -hmm. because it's not as if nothing happens but it kind of leads up to a point where the players are going to have to go do this thing to continue the adventure so why not kind of cut out the middleman and just start there right nice i tried not to give spoilers good good our situation was the two-hour session so it made it a little clumsy so if you're worried about finishing it in one session chris suggested starting at the airlock of the chronos and explaining the distress call brought the characters out of cryosleep and that's where you are and i think if you don't include any of the optional events maybe four to six hours it's Mm. doable yeah i mean because there's a lot of extra things you can add in there to slow people down but if you really streamline it i think it's possible i did but it, i think it varies from group to group too because mm. if there's like our group is arguing about a lot of decision there's a lot of slow decision making up and until <laughs> some horrible crap happened right. and then we went right back to arguing after that thing happened <laughs> right yeah even in the pdf of the chariot of the gods in mm-hmm. the gm section they they kind of say don't rush things take your time give the characters a lot of time or as much time as they need to explore because mm-hmm. because you could actually play it like a dungeon crawl technically i mean yeah, you're, you're yeah. exploring the spaceship i mean stuff does happen but there's no set time where it does have to happen so mm-hmm. the correct answer to have these things happen are kind of when the characters stumble into it and trigger it and or when the players appear to be getting bored mm, right, so right. that's that's what i'm going to try and go with all right we're all interested in hearing how the results <laughs> hopefully not terribly <laughs> yes and, and one more thing that I wanted to mention was a bundle of holding. And I Ooh. think this is a, this is a, a worthwhile thing. So, um, bundle of holding is just resurrecting their, uh, July 2017 Catalyst bundle. Mm. But the reason that they're doing this, so Catalyst is a line of kind of generic fantasy supplements and a couple of them that I had in my childhood that I loved dearly. So they're from Flying Buffalo and uh, Rick Loomis was the founder of Flying Buffalo, the publisher of Tunnels and Trolls. So he designed the first ever solo adventure for that system. Mm. And right now he's facing overwhelming medical bills from treatment of lymphatic cancer. So his his family set up a GoFundMe campaign, and then Bundle of Holding has also resurrected this bundle, so that will help support. So okay, the charity, cool. the charity that you know this bundle is supporting is right. the, the creator of, of Flying Buffalo. Yeah, so we'll put a link both to the GoFundMe and also to the Bundle of Holding. 
But the books that I really loved were the uh, Traps books. Okay. So they released Traps and Traps 2 and Traps 3. And the, the, uh, I think it's Let me guess, eight. Traps 4. <laughs> yeah. But they always spelled it wrong. Like Traps 8 is spelled A T E. Okay. Know, so, okay. Yeah. so they themed them a little bit about around the misspelling of the numbers. Traps 2 and T- 2 is T O O. Okay. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's but um, yeah. It's, like a, it's a book of like 100 traps to set up in a dungeon that are system independent. So they, oh, that's they cool. don't work in anything. So I really love that and just would go through that book constantly dreaming of Imagining like, all the gruesome fates you were going to throw right. your characters into. Yeah. Yeah. That made me think of a topic for a future podcast that we kind of touched on a little mm. bit, talking about Dwarven Forge and kind of a pre-built dungeon table. The antagonism, or kind of not antagonism, but the com- competitive nature okay. of role-playing games that is not quite as popular anymore. Storytelling and character, I think, is is much more what people want to do. But back in the day, and why they would make things like the Traps books, is that you would want to throw something at you know, the party. Like the, the DM was trying to win, essentially, by making an, okay, un- yeah. an unbeatable adventure. And it was kind of challenging challenging the party to survive my hidden right. tomb or beat this temple and uncover all the mysteries and don't go into the insta-kill trap death room because mm. I'm going to give you some clues that are going to tell right. you, you will die if you go into this room. Well, that's what the Tomb of Horrors was, wasn't it? Right, it, it was right. that that it was kind of a competitive module, right. specifically designed because Gygax's players pretty much got too smart. Right. And it was kind of <laughs> like a big middle finger mm-hmm. to, okay, all the things you normally did, instantly kill your character this yes. time. Right, right. Which from today's <laughs> viewpoint, until I learned that, I'm like looking at this thing going, this is bullshit, <laughs> right? Who wants to play the stupid adventure? I'm like, oh, because you were trying to kind of be a dick about it. All right. Yeah, right, right. As we've brought up before on this podcast, Hasbro would love to resurrect a competitive kind of, you know, esport version of... <sighs> Dungeons and Dragons. So if that happens, and if that's possible, if those sorts of things do start to become popular again, they really want to t- you know monetize that and take advantage I'm, of it. I'm sure they do. Yeah. I mean, and I'm sure people will watch it. You know, I'm honestly to, to bring it back. The thing I'm always talking about. I am kind of running into that issue with the Alien game. Mm. I think at the beginning of the session, I'm going to have to say, okay, look, I, the GM, am not out to kill your character because mm-hmm. then you sit out for the rest of the game, right. pretty much, and and no one has fun. But this is a horror game, <laughs> and there's a lot of stuff that mm-hmm. is trying to kill you, mm-hmm. or just at, at best ambivalent and doesn't care. So while I'm I'm not trying to like kill characters, mm-hmm. there's a large chance that people just die a lot. Right, right. And I, I think we're like talking to other people. I think our group was somehow either super lucky or super smart or just like super dumb mm-hmm. where none of us died mm-hmm. for the most part. Right, right. Everyone else is like, oh yeah, we all died. And it's like, oh, okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. But I mean, I think at least now you have to say something like the place your character going into is pretty lethal the inhabitants the characters are the ones that are trying to kill you or the events that happen are pretty at best ambivalent or or neutral i want to see you succeed Mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean there aren't going to be challenges and that doesn't mean i'm going to pull my punches Mm -hmm. something else i'm thinking about i'm having to rethink my pretty adamant stance on using a gm screen ah yeah because there are things i don't want the characters to know and i'm wondering if i should roll out in the open for this alien game Mm -hmm. or whether that would take away some of the horror aspect or mm, not. Mm. Now I'll have to report back on that later. I think that's a, a good point I'm, and I'm curious about that. Yeah, because I think hiding some of those roles to make the effects work better for the mm. kind of scary atmosphere. I don't know if it would be effect, but you kind of don't want seeing the result of something. Everyone knows that what happens is based on dice rolls. Mm -hmm. It's just something we know, but actually seeing it there on the table might take players out of that, Mm -hmm. where it's like, oh, this thing happened because the GM rolled a three. And Mm -hmm. they can see the three right there. (laughs) And, you know, so everyone knows that happens, but having it right there in your face might take away some of the enjoyment. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Like we talked about before with some of their tables too, it might give you the chance to kind of make it work better in the narrative or make it work better story-wise. If it's like, oh, you just start screaming (laughs) mid-conversation. One thing I will not do is fudge dice. Yeah. Right, right, right. The description of the effects, I think, can be oh, yeah, customized yeah. much, yeah, much yeah, better. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Th- something I was thinking of as well. Yeah. So where can people find you? Instagram mm-hmm. or Twitter, as usual. And I'm doing a bit more on Facebook, too, although I don't like it that much. It's HiveMind, H-Y-V-E-M-Y-N-D, at pretty much everywhere on social media. Also, I do a weekly single panel gag cartoon, which you can find at abusecartoons.com. There's a live stream every Sunday night, uh, North American time on both twitch.tv slash abuse cartoons and abuse cartoons on YouTube. That's about an hour, hour to two hours every Sunday night. So you can watch me draw that week's cartoons and I'll read some comments from the previous week. Do a little bit of uh, convenience store shopping in Japan. You can follow on Twitter at abuse cartoons. If you'd like to get in touch with 
Outer Red Hands, outerredhands.com, on Twitter at Outer Red Hands. And if you want to support the podcast, become more involved, patreon.com slash Outer Red Hands and become a patron. So you get access to our archives and resources and then things that uh, we're working on. You can have some say about it, what games you'd like to see us play and maybe even play with us. So uh, take a look at Patreon and uh, get involved. That is it for this week. So we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Thank you.